Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday Worship here at Kennesaw United Methodist Church. I'm Lindsay Peterson, and I'm the Director of Modern Worship here. Um, and we're just so happy you stopped by, that you stopped your Facebook scrolling or YouTube video watching to just to tune in to you know what we're doing here at Kennesaw and we're just so glad that you could join us please comment in the comment section to say that you're here and let us know if, if we can pray for you in any way um, we are so excited to have you stop by and have a wonderful night of worship but before we get started let's go to the Lord in prayer Father I just pray that tonight we um, we become listeners and listen for your presence and your words. For it is so easy to, even on our phones or on our laptops or iPads, to get distracted. And while all that is so fun, it can be very fun to do, we need to be able to sit still and listen to you. So that is my prayer for tonight, that we are listeners and we listen to your voice and for your words and for your truth. In your name we pray, amen.
Jesus. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for being such a beautiful name and a powerful name and a wonderful name because you chose to do the ultimate sacrifice and lay down your life for us who maybe were not the most deserving for that, but you saw a bigger picture that wasn't just about rules, but about grace and love. So we thank you for that, for seeing beyond what we could even see or grasp. And I also pray that as we keep pushing through tonight and just through the rest of our walk or our journey through faith, that we truly do encounter you and who you are. I think that's all we truly want is to be near you, to be in your presence. So I pray that we have that. And I pray that we see you and that you allow us to see you and hear you. In your name we pray, amen. Good evening. I want to welcome you to the Wednesday worship service. I hope that you have enjoyed the band and the music that they have used to lead us into the throne room of God and into God's presence. You know, over the last several years, zombies have been a big deal. Zombies have been big business. There have been TV shows and books and movies all about the zombie apocalypse. Because at some level, there is a sort of a fear of things that have been dead coming back to life. Even to the point that the CDC has warned us to prepare ourselves for the zombie apocalypse. Now, it was an ad campaign to get the attention of everyone to give them instructions on how to prepare for natural disasters and fires and such like that. Things like making sure that you have water and food and medication and tools and supplies, bedding. Although, and, and when they go through this list, I'm not sure how you're supposed to run away from a zombie carrying all of that. But even they got into the, this zombie apocalypse. Even they use this idea of the dead coming back to life to help people prepare. But 
when we look at Scripture and when we look at what Jesus has done for us, the dead really do come back to life. And so I'm going to invite you to turn with me today to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of the works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In many ways, this sermon today is a part two or a continuation of the sermon from Sunday. And I'm going to start in a way where we left off Sunday. And that is that the cross is the intersection where death meets life. Because Jesus' death is our life. His death on the cross is what brought us back to life in him. And Paul, in this letter, tells us that we've been dead. We've been dead in our trespasses. We've been dead in our sins. And it is Jesus on the cross, God's grace and God's love, that has brought us alive again. Now, sin is a failure to be what we ought to be or what we could be. We often try to define what sin is, sin, you know, the wrong things. We think about breaking the Ten Commandments or doing some other thing that we consider wrong, whether it's stealing or lying. And all of those, that is true, but it's because in those times of doing things, that, doing something that breaks the rules, if you will, we are not what we ought to be and we are not living the way that we could. But sin is not something that theologians have invented. It's not something that they made up to make us feel guilty. It's not something that they made up to shame us. Sin is something that permeates our life. It is, in, it is infused into our being. It is just part of this fallen world. And in addition to sin being a failure of living the way we ought to or being the way we ought to, sin is also missing the mark, missing the bullseye, flying a little wide of where we should be. And Paul, in this passage, uses two words. He uses sins and then he uses trespasses. And we're, we might sit here and say, well, why two different words? Because when we say the Lord's Prayer, we don't use two different words. We use the word trespasses interchangeably with the word sin. So why two words? And the word that we translate as sin in Greek means is an archery term, and it means missing the mark. And the word that is translated for trespasses means slipping or falling, not staying on the path with which you originally set out on. And so it's a failure to make life what it is capable of being made. It's a failure to hold the road or the path with which 
we originally started on, it is a failure to hit the bullseye. But we're, we're all in this together. There's not a single person who has not missed the mark. There's not a single person that has not slipped and fallen. There's not a single person that has not maybe wandered off the road that they were called to be on or that they should be on. There's not a single one of us that has that is exactly who we ought to be. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as Paul has told us. But there's hope for us because Jesus came, lived a life that shows us what we fully ought to be, died on the cross as a way to forgive our sins, and then rose again, thereby bringing us also back to life. And forgiveness of sin is central to being made alive. Being made alive. Forgiveness is a, such a necessary part of that. But the reason we're dead in our sins and our trespasses is because sin kills. Sin kills innocence. And once we've lost our innocence, we're never the same. It leaves a permanent effect. Once we've done that first thing that we know is wrong or that we know we shouldn't do, our innocence is lost and sin has killed it. Sin kills ideals that make life worthwhile. Now, I like to always hang around with and speak, talk to people that we consider idealistic, that have this vision of life that we might say that they've been looking through rose-colored glasses or that they have painted such beautiful colors, and we might want to tell them that life's not really like that. Those ideals that you have, are just, that's just not real life. But to, to be with people that still have their ideals, that are still idealistic, is such a joy to be around. It's a joy to be around someone who, whose sin has not killed off their ideals. But the thing about the way that sin kills off our ideals is that each time we sin, I'm gonna, let's use lying for an example. Each time we lie, we might hold truth as an ideal in our lives, but each time we lie, it gets a little bit easier to tell the next lie. That first lie, we might be going, eh, and it might be hard. And we might feel a little bit of a prick of our conscience. But every time we do it, it becomes easier to do it the next time. And we slip and we fall. And our ideals have been killed. And then sin kills the will. But I'm going to go back just a moment. Because the other area where sin kills ideals is... I'm going to use myself as an example. I love soda. And you might say I'm addicted to soda... It's an amazing elixir of life for me. And at the beginning of this year, I gave it up. Now, I've given it up other times before. It's not the first time for me. It's not my first rodeo. And I'll do really well for a while. I'll hold on to that ideal of not needing to have a soda every day, not needing the caffeine, sugar, fizzy combination that just makes you go, ah. And I'll do really well for a while. And then I'll think, 
I can have just one sip. One sip will be fine. I can do that. That one sip then makes it easier to take the next. And then the next. And then before you know it, I'm drinking a bottle. Or before you know it, I'm drinking two bottles a day. Next thing you know, I'm wiping out a six-pack in a heartbeat. Because each time I compromised, each time I slipped a little bit, it made it easier for the next time. Which ties into the fact that sin kills our will. At first, we engage in something because we want to. I had that first sip of soda because I wanted to. But in the end, we engage in that activity because we cannot help ourselves. That first sip I took because I desired it. And down the road, I'm drinking a 12-pack of soda because I can't help myself. It kills our will. And once something becomes a habit, it is not far from becoming a necessity. Having that habit of drinking maybe just a little bit of soda every morning to get the caffeine kickstart in the morning, to go and get that day kickstarted, it becomes a habit, and I got to do it every day. And then before long, I have to do it every day. I have to have my soda every day because it has become a necessity. It has moved from an act to a habit to a necessity. There's a saying, and I did not find who came up with this saying, but it is said that if you sow an act, you will reap a habit. And if you sow a habit, you will reap a character. And when you sow a character, you reap a destiny. Sin kills. It kills our innocence. It kills our ideals. It kills our will. But there's hope. Because of Christ, our sins are forgiven. And we are made alive again. Christ takes away the guilt, the sense of guilt that comes from our lost innocence. He does not restore our innocence. The scars remain. They're still there. They still inform who we are. But because of forgiveness, because of what Christ has done on the cross, we no longer have to feel guilty about it. It makes God approachable because when we're in our guilt over our lost innocence over our dead innocence when we're in our guilt we don't want to approach God God is scary at that point we can't approach God we might get judged we might get punished but Jesus tore the veil when he died on that cross making God approachable once again because our innocence, the guilt that we have over the loss of it has been taken away. And Christ reawakens the ideals of our heart. We can look at people now and not have that sense of mistrust or what are they trying to get from me What do they want? Christ reawakens our ideals. There was a story I read, and you might not know who George Matheson is, but he was a preacher in the late 1800s in Scotland. Um, Hymn writer, wrote books, um, and remarkably was blind. Started losing his sight when he was in seminary. And it's told that in the congregation in Edinburgh to which George Matheson came, there was an old woman who lived in a cellar in filthy conditions. After some months of Matheson's ministry, communion time came around, 
And when the elder called this old woman's cellar with the cards so that she could have communion, he found that she had gone. He tracked her down, and he found her in an attic room. Now, she was very poor, and there were no luxuries. But the attic was as light and airy and clean as the cellar had been dark and dismal and dirty. And George Matheson says, I see you've changed your house. And she says, I, I have. You cannot hear George Matheson preach and live in a cellar. The Christian message that he had been preaching had rekindled her ideal and lifted her from a place of darkness and dirt to a place of light and air. I also saw these words. Deep in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Sin kills our innocence. It kills our ideals. But in those moments, Christ can restore those feelings and take away that guilt. The third thing that sin kills is, is our will. And Christ revives and restores that lost will because the great love that put him on the cross is always a cleansing thing. And it changes our destiny, can change our character. It starts to work backwards. As you remember, if you sow an act, you reap a habit. And if you sow a habit, you reap a character. And if you sow a character, you reap a destiny. But if you work backwards, Christ changes your destiny so that you can have a new character, so that you can change your habits, so that you can act with the same love that Christ did when he went to the cross. The cross is the intersection where death meets life, and it is a gift that we have been given. Salvation is entirely God's gift. Paul tells us that it is by grace that we have been saved, not by our works. It is is grace through faith that has delivered us. That's not to negate the need for works, but it is not the works that we do that save us. It is Entirely God's doing. It is entirely God who has delivered us from death to life. We are God's handiwork. Created, recreated as a new creation. Born anew, as John tells us in Sunday's passage, in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're God's accomplishment. If we have accepted Christ as our Savior, if we have been born again, we are God's accomplishment. And God has plans for us. God planned for the good works that we should be doing to be our way of life. Because we're alive again. And the journey to the cross is followed by a journey out of the grave. Let us pray. Gracious God, we're not zombies, but we were dead. We were dead in our sins. We were dead in our trespasses. And you brought us to life again. It is through Jesus' life, death, resurrection that you have restored life to us. You have forgiven our sins. You have 
taken away the guilt of our lost innocence. You have restored our ideals. You have restored our will. And we give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand here in the power of Christ we stand always feels really weird coming back on here and standing in front of Lindsay, so I'm going to yeah, try to stand back in. here. Come on in, I'll make room. <laughs> I hope that this week finds you refreshed. I hope that this service has refreshed freshed you and brought you peace, brought you into the throne room of God, into God's presence. And I hope that you go forth through the rest of the week knowing that God loves you. May the grace of God the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us throughout the remainder of this week. In Jesus' name, amen.